In this video, I'd like to go through a complete PCB design using the new Raspberry Pi RP2040 microcontroller. I've made a little PCB. This is about 50 by 20, 25 millimeters. Also castellated holes that you can mount on a carrier PCB, for example, and solder these pads down to the other PCB. This PCB contains everything that the RP2040 needs to work. So that includes QSBI flash memory, is a buck converter to produce a 3.3 watt rail, or the decoupling capacitors, USB series termination resistors, crystal oscillator, and so on. So all the minimum equipment required for this RP2040 to work, and I've broken out all of the signal pins to these castellated pads. I'd like to show you this design, just the schematic, how I did the routing and layout. And I've done this in Altium, but of course this transfers to every other PCB design software, KiCad as well. So I hope you enjoy the video and let's get started. A big thank you also to Altium for sponsoring this video. I use Altium Designer for my work and also in my spare time as well. I find it quite easy to use, a lot more powerful than KiCad, at least in its current state. And it lets me really get quite intricate designs done, for example, high speed or any anything more complicated. And they are actually offering a free trial for you to get started. So if you just follow the link, I'll leave it in the description, altium.com slash altium dash trial dash flow. Again, I'll leave the link in the description and it'd be cool if you just check that out. Now, at the time of making this video, the RP2040 was released not too long ago, so it's a pretty new MCU and it looks pretty interesting, and also how you can program it with MicroPython and so on. In future videos, I'd of course like to go through also the programming of this device and see how we can actually use that in real-world applications. JLC PCB actually stocks this part as well, which is really nice. It's an extended part, and as you can see, it's rather cheap. It's about $1.20, and they still have a couple hundred in stock, so I suggest you maybe try out your own boards after you've watched this video and try to come up with your own designs. I've actually ordered this board uh, with JLC. You can see here I've put it in and it cost me, I think, I know, just uh, about $100 to get 10 of these boards made. So that's that's really quite cheap. And I'd, I'm looking forward to playing around with these when I get them in my hands. But for now, I just want to walk you through the design process. Now, there are two main documents you'll need when you start designing with this RP2040 microcontroller. And one of these is the datasheet itself. And this is a pretty long document, about 650 pages. It contains everything about the registers, about pin descriptions and so on, which pins are multiplexed, like I squared C, UART, and so on. But a big help for actual hardware design is this hardware design guide, a hardware design with the RP2040. So I encourage you to look through that. It's a far shorter document with only 32 pages. And a lot of my design is actually based on this document. So you can see, for example, how to do the power supplies, how to place the decoupling capacitors, voltage regulators, uh, the storage, crystal oscillator, and so on. But I'll walk you through this in my design one by one. So let's get started. So here we are in Altum Designer and looking at the schematics. The schematic consists of two pages, which I've labeled as one and two, power and MCU. So first thing before we get into the RP2040 design is how I actually label my components when I have multi-page schematics. As you can see, one underscore power is what I've called the schematic page. And that's why I start all my labeling with, for example, the capacitors at C100, then I go to C101, C102, C103. Same for resistors and any other components. So I start at 100 and label it on. And then for example, for the second page, for my MCU page, I will start at 200 with every component. And that makes it really easy to see, for example, when I'm debugging or when I'm routing and doing my layout of the PCB, where is the component in which schematic page? Just by starting at a different number. Of course, for larger schematics, you might want to start at 1,000 or 2,000. So back to the power supply. I chose to use a buck converter here just for efficiency and that I have a quite a large input voltage range. For this, I typically always go to jlcpcb.com and their parts library. So if you jlcpcb.com slash parts, and then I search, for example, for DC-DC converters. I wanted a pretty small package. So this SOT23 six pin package is just right. It's got quite a lot of output current, which is overkill for this RP2040, but maybe I want to power some other things with this board. And it has an input voltage range up to about 28 volts. So that's really good. So the schematic is pretty much taken directly from the datasheet. Again, the datasheet you can find uh, also via the JLC PCB parts library. It tells you how to calculate all the values for the inductors, capacitors, feedback resistors, and so on. And that's pretty much all I did. So my output voltage is 3.3 volts and all these components, the inductors, capacitors, feedback network are chosen using the help of the datasheet. It's as simple as that. As you can see, I also have all of these pad components here, and these are actually later then going to be used for the castellated pads of this PCB. So you'll see them a lot throughout this schematic. I also have, of course, an indicator LED, which I always think is quite nice to indicate that at least some sort of power is being applied and this regulator maybe is working. Another thing I do is label each and every net in my schematic. This is really, really useful when you're routing later on. So for example, my VCC is named, even my enable pin here, I've put a little net label for my bootstrap capacitor, switch output feedback. 
every single net in my schematics are labeled and that really helps when you're routing later instead of figuring out you know what is c104 pad one for example this really helps so i encourage you to do that in all of your schematics and that's pretty much all there is to this buck converter design i haven't included any esd protection and so on because i assume that will be placed on the carrier pcb so moving on to the second page of this schematic, this is the actual RP2040 microcontroller, and it requires some external quad SPI flash memory, which we'll talk about. Again, almost all of this information I'm getting from this hardware design guide uh, with RP2040 from the Raspberry Pi website, but I'll just go through it step by step with you in Altium. So as usual, we have all our VDD and power supply pins at the top and our ground pins at the bottom. And for every IO VDD or VDD pin, we would like at least a 100 nanofarad capacitor, as small package as possible. So I typically go with 0402 because 0201 is very hard, or at least hard to hand assemble. And I believe JLC PCB doesn't offer it at the moment. There are some special requirements for the RP2040, especially for these VREG in and VREG out pins. And these VREG pins are actually an internal regulator, the inputs and outputs, and that steps down the input voltage, for example, 3.3 volts to 1.1 volts, which is needed by some of the internal circuitry. So that's why you need these one microfarad capacitors placed close to VREG V in and VREG V out. And I just typically annotate that in the schematic to make sure, okay, when I'm layouting that I typically pay attention to that as well. Now again, the 1.1 volts is generated internally by the RP2040, and then we can use that to feed the DVDD pins of this chip. Again, 100 nanofarads per DVDD or IOVDD, and then we have a one microfarad for the VREG Vout, and again, one microfarad for the VREG VIN. And that takes care of all the power supply. Now this RP2040 pretty much only has one ground pad and that's in the center. This is a QFN package, which we'll see later when we're doing the layout. And we have this EP, which is the ground pad and that's tied to ground. Then on the left side here, we have all the GPIO connections. So these could be PWM outputs, uh, UART, I squared C, SPI, and so on. And that's detailed in the data sheet of this chip. But I've just labeled them a GPIO 1 to 29 and then connected them to these castellated pads, which we'll be seeing later. On the other side, we have the USB differential pair. So this uh, chip supports USB 1, I believe, uh, natively, and it requires 27 ohm termination resistors, which are placed close to the side of the RP2040. Again, this is detailed in the hardware design guide. In Altium, again, I give this net names and I have to end them in either underscore P or underscore N to make sure Altium knows, okay, this is differential pair, but I also have to give it this directive, which you see here, and this is indicating to Altium, this is a differential pair and we'll need that later for routing. And these again are broken out to castellated pads. Then we have all the quad SPI connections. So we have four data input outputs, the clock and the chip select. And we'll see in just a second how we hook that up to the quad SPI flash memory. Then we need a crystal oscillator. I believe the RP2040 can actually run just with an internal oscillator, but things like UART will require an external one for more accurate timing. We have our typical crystal oscillator network here. We have the crystal, which needs to be 12 megahertz. I looked at the data sheet for this specific one and it has a load capacitance of 20 picofarads. And then I can calculate these load capacitors to be 30 picofarads. The way I do this, I start with my load capacitance. I subtract maybe four or five picofarads of stray capacitance due to BTB routing and traces. So that'll give me about 15 picofarads. And then I multiply that number by two to give me 30 picofarads. And that's why I have 30 picofarads here and here. You can see that I have this sort of feed resistor over here. This is just to limit the drive level into the crystal so we don't overdrive the, the signal and we don't generate additional harmonics. You might have to play around with this value of R202 just to get it right, but this should probably get you in the right ballpark. Now the device can be programmed via USB, I believe, but for further debugging, uh, they have these serial wire debug pins, uh, the clock and data IO, which can be useful. So I've broken those out as well. Run is pretty much a reset or enable signal of this chip, broken that out as well. And test enable is, I believe, a pin they use in the factory when they test this chip. So they'll put it high in the factory to make sure everything in this chip works and put it low when you're actually using this in your own devices. So this should always be tied to ground. All right, so that's pretty much all there is for the RP2040 connections. Uh, remember there was this quad SPI connection over here and this connects to this quad SPI flash memory down here. The hardware design guide says it needs to be quite a specific bit of memory. And it's this Winbond W25Q128JVSIQ, which is quite a mouthful, but this is definitely supported by the RP2040 and that's why I went with it. Additionally, the W25Q128JVSIQ is actually a basic part of JLC PCB and they've got loads of them in stock, so that's really nice. So JLC has the RP2040 in stock, the flash memory that's supported and all other components.
Okay, so as usual for this flash memory, we have one power pin, one ground pin, and we need at least a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor to make this thing function properly. We have all the QSBI connections here and here, and we have these two resistors. Now these resistors, as detailed in the hardware design guide, are there if you want to boot, for example, from this flash memory, or if you want to use, for example, the USB to boot. And this is detailed in the hardware design guide. But these are the recommended resistors from our Raspberry Pi. As you can see, I've written DNP here, and that's for do not place. So this indicates to me later that this should not be populated for assembly. And in terms of circuitry, that's pretty much all there is for this RP2040 little breakout castellated hole board. So now we can move over to layout and routing. So here we are now in the layout and routing view of Altium Designer. This is a 3D view, which I quite like in Altium. So you can see the front and the rear sides. Now you might notice that these castellated pads don't look particularly castellated. That's the way I've done it. Basically, I have, if I switch to 2D mode, I have placed the edge of the pad directly on the edge of the board outline. So when I produce the manufacturing files and a JLC PCB, they'll know, okay, well, I need to cut, they need to cut the board here. And this will then produce this castellated pad because these are plated through holes. So just imagine the board outline intersects all these holes and that gives us these castellated pads. That's the way I've done it. And uh, I believe that should work. Okay, so let's go the routing one by one. So if I press two on Altium, I go to my 2D view and if I press Shift S, I can cycle through which layers are visible. Now this is a four layer board. I have my top layer, as you can see in the bottom here. I have an inner ground layer. I have another ground layer on the other side, and then I have my bottom layer. This is the typical stack up I use these days for four layer boards. So I have signals top and bottom with ground planes on the middle. And this is really great for signal integrity and EMI, but I do need to stitch these two ground planes together. I don't do any copper pores or fills on the top and bottom layer, that is for ground or power, and I typically root my power. So starting with the buck converter section, which I've put up here, I have my power input also up here, which then goes into the first decoupling capacitor or bypass capacitor for this regulated IC over here. Now this layout I've actually gotten from the data sheet from this particular chip, from this Texas Instruments chip, and they recommend uh, keeping the layout like this. As you can see, this board is actually pretty small, so it's about 25 millimeters across, and I've tried to keep all the loop areas for this buck converter very, very tight and very small. I've used copper pores to connect, the, for example, the capacitors to the output side of the inductor, and also the input, and so forth. With buck converters, you always want to minimize the area you use for them and keep everything as tight and neat as possible. Another thing to pay attention to is also the feedback network. So we have the feedback network of this buck converter over here. And if I switch to 2D view, we can see it a bit better. So we have the buck feedback pin over here, and this is through this resistor and capacitive divider network over here. I could just route the tray straight from the 3.3 volts uh, back here. So this is my feedback line. But what I'm doing, I'm placing a via, routing it on the opposite side, and then coming up just on the output side of my capacitors. And this is typically how you want to do it. You want to do a thin trace from the output of your capacitors, so not taking it from the inductor, and you want to route that trace as far away as possible from your inductor. So that's why I switched the board side and then route a very thin or rather thin trace and then back up again into my feedback network and back into my buck converter controller. So for the buck converter design, again, you want to minimize the loop areas and pay extra attention to that critical feedback trace. Traces, for example, the enable trace aren't that important and can be routed almost any way you like. So minimize loop areas and pay attention to that feedback network and feedback trace. Then moving on to another important part of the design, it's the actual RP2040 routing. For all the GPIO connections, all I'm doing is breaking it out from the QFN package and to the relevant castellated holes or castellated pads on the side. More importantly, however, is the placement and connections of all these decoupling and bypass capacitors. It's quite hard with the QFN package to get them as close as possible, especially if you're trying to root out all of these connections. But I've still tried to place all of these decoupling and bypass capacitors as close as possible to the relevant power pins. Then I have fairly wide traces going directly into these power pins like this. And on the other side, for example, these ground connections, I have a very fat and short trace going to via into my ground plane. And we can see that a bit better in the 2D view again. So you can see here, for example, I have my 3.3 volts going with thick traces very close to my uh, decoupling capacitors. On the other side of the decoupling capacitors, very thick and wide trace going into my ground via, which then connects to my ground planes. And this makes sure you minimize inductance, and this is really good for power delivery. You can also see I haven't bridged my QFN pads 
just straight with a trace, for example, from here to here. This is sometimes a bit hard to see in the assembly process and the optical inspection might give an error showing that these pads are shorted. In, in other words, you want to route your traces, for example, like this. As I said before, in the schematic view, we have this central ground pad of the QFN chip, and this is pretty much all the ground connections for this chip. We use some vias, again, into the ground planes below. So again, keep your decoupling capacitors close, short white traces, and then short white traces on the other side of the capacitors to ground for your ground planes. Other than that, try to keep space between your traces so as soon as you can break away, you should widen the space between your traces to minimize crosstalk and coupling. So that's what I do. Of course, with the QFN package, it's quite hard. But again, as soon as you can break them apart, these traces do so. Another critical part of the routing is actually the placement and routing of this crystal network over here. You can see we have the feed resistor, we have the two load capacitors here and the crystal. I typically try to route the traces out and then again, separate them as quickly as I can and place everything in the path of this crystal. So we wanna minimize our trace length, we wanna minimize the capacitive load and we put additionally on this crystal. I've put also a bit of a, you can say like a guard fence, with these vias around it, and that helps a tiny bit so these traces don't uh, couple over into this crystal and vice versa. So I just place a couple of ground vias around it, fairly equally spaced, and then connect them to my ground points in my crystal circuit. As always is the case with PCB design, you want to maximize your distance between sensitive components. That's why, for example, this crystal is on this side and the buck converter is on this side. Also, the buck converter is generally quite far away from the RP2040, and that always helps. So it's all about the space, as uh, Rick Hartley, I believe, says, keep space between sensitive components and things that might capacitively or inductively couple into each other, which you don't want them to. The QSPI is over here, and those are fairly um, easy to route. They're, you don't have to pay too much attention to them. As long as you keep the traces fairly short, you won't need any termination resistors. So as the case here, this is maybe a centimeter apart from the RP2040, and there's nothing too special here. Again, we want to place our decoupling capacitor for this chip really close to the relevant pin. This is the power pin of this device, and use fat short traces to connect it to the ground and power. We also have these termination resistors for the USB line over here. And as you can see, these are the ones over here. You can see I've chosen to keep these further away than the decoupling capacitors. In my eyes, decoupling capacitors come first and then series termination resistors. If I had a bit more space on this board, of course, I would want to move these two termination resistors closer to the IC. And that's what the hardware design guide tells us as well. That's fine. And again, this USB differential pair is routed, as you'd expect differentially, to the pads over here. Again, on the note of actually labeling your nets as we did in the schematic, as you can see, all of these pads have their proper net labels. And this is really useful. Instead of suddenly just being like pad two of, of chip U200, we actually really know what everything belongs to. And that's really nice for our routing and layout. In terms of power routing, uh, because I'm using two internal ground planes, I actually just routed power on the back. So I have a large 3.3 volt trace running throughout the board and then feeding my different points in the circuit. And for a low speed design like this, this is absolutely fine. As soon as you move into the higher speed domains, you will want dedicated power planes. Again, because we are using two ground planes, we need to use stitching vias. So a lot of these unconnected vias you see scattered across the board are actually just ground vias to stitch these two ground planes together. And I've done that because of space constraints only in the places where I could. So for example, I don't have any space here, so I can't place any ground vias here, obviously. So that was the quick run through of this RP2040 design. I hope you liked the video and I'm looking forward to getting these boards back from JLC PCB. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please leave them below in the comments. And I look forward to testing out this RP2040 chip. It'll be the first time for me and look forward to also making a carrier board for this and then showing it off in a future video. Thanks again for watching.